is a resource webinar for clinical mental health counselors and other mental health professionals um, to help us with addressing the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. Um, for those of you who don't know, Suncoast Mental Health Counselors Association is the Tampa Bay Area Association for Mental Health Professionals. And although uh, we're our predominant professional identity is clinical mental health counselors. Certainly LMFTs and LCSWs and psychologists are also welcome in our association. We have many active members who are um, allied health practitioners of other mental health professions. SOMCA is a chapter of the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association, which is the state chapter of the American Mental Health Counselors Association. And ANCA is the largest national association that exclusively represents clinical mental health counselors in the United States. And here are the websites for the three organizations if you're interested in checking those out. For the first 30 minutes today, we're going to give you an update on some pertinent laws, some board rules, and some executive orders, and even some federal um, government resources that relate to COVID-19 and our work as mental health professionals. We'll also cover some precautions for those of you who are having in-person contact with clients. And we'll also discuss the transition to telehealth. And then finally, some resources for how to stay updated as we continue to get new information daily on our response to COVID-19. In the second 30 minutes, we'll be collaborating. You'll be unmuting yourselves and you'll be free to ask questions, share resources, ideas, and information with each other. So it'll be much more informal for the second half. Now, before we go any further here, I'm going to stop my screen sharing for a moment because I'm going to launch a polling question. Um, it's a quick polling question. It's really two questions in one. The first question is, we're, we're curious about what percentage of attendees are currently only meeting with clients in person right now? Um, which ones are meeting through telehealth only? And how many of you are a, meet, doing a combination of in-person and telehealth meetings at this point? It looks like 51% uh, of you are meeting through telehealth only, and then 23% uh, in-person only, and 26% both in-person and telehealth. You know what's really interesting? This is almost exactly the results that we got last night with a different group of counselors that we presented with. 51% of them said they're doing telehealth only as well. Or actually, I think last night it was 53%, but very close numbers. All right, so first change in laws and rules that we want to make sure you know about. Some of you already are aware of this, but the Office for Civil Rights, which is under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, they did make an announcement that they're not going to impose penalties for noncompliance with regulatory requirements under HIPAA for covered health care providers who are acting in good faith to provide telehealth during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, some people have sort of interpreted this as a blanket. You, it's perfectly okay for you to use non-HIPAA platforms. I don't interpret it that way, and neither do most authorities that I've spoken to. This is more a, in a pinch, emergency situation. Um, if it comes to providing somebody with care or not, then we're going to look the other way for right now. Um, but the reality is I would strongly suggest that you not use any HIPAA, um, non-HIPAA compliant platform, um, if at all possible, because you do have a free HIPAA compliant resource available to you. Um, it is doxy.me, um, and you can use it from any mobile device or tablet or computer. And uh, I don't, I, I, if given that you have readily available HIPAA compliant options, it would make sense to me that you would use those resources at this time. As far as Doxy goes, um, we have had some people claim that Doxy, they were getting some tech problems, some connection problems with it, especially at the beginning of uh, COVID-19 really reaching the US. Um, it appears that Doxy, perhaps they were sort of inundated with healthcare providers. And we've also been getting reports that no longer are people having that issue. We've also gotten reports that people who had the Doxy Pro account never had the issue about um, connection problems um, because there is a paid version of Doxy that costs $35 a month, um, their Pro account. And the difference between the Pro account and the free account is that the Pro account allows you to do group sessions 
which uh, were which would be two to ten clients in the room, but it also apparently has like superior support and that sort of thing. Um, so that's another option available to you. Also, the announcement from the uh, feds about HIPAA compliance does not have anything to do with state laws that may still create a problem if you're using resources like FaceTime or Skype that are not HIPAA compliant. Um, and of course, we have our ethical obligation to safeguard client confidentiality and privacy. So uh, I would still encourage you to try and use HIPAA compliant platforms. And lastly, we don't know how long uh, we're going to be practicing social distancing, but um, I'm kind of anticipating that you know, we might be looking at about a year or so of social distancing in various um, forms. So I would encourage you to think long term and consider platforms that will be viable going forward because this temporary relaxation of HIPAA um, enforcement, I don't think it's going to necessarily last very long. Now, I am going to just take a look at the chat box here because um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, folks chiming in. Um, Somebody's asked, is Zoom HIPAA compliant? And are there any other HIPAA compliant platforms? Yes, there are many. We're gonna show you the other ones in just a few slides. And there is a way to make Zoom HIPAA compliant, but the standard HIPAA, the free platform is not HIPAA compliant. So we will get to that, those questions in just a moment here. The next change I wanna let you know about is that there is a change, the 491 board has issued an emergency rule concerning registered interns. Now, this was a direct result of FOMCA's advocacy on the behalf of our profession. We had contacted the executive director of the 491 board, and we said, um, so we're trying to practice social distancing, but also we can't do supervision groups via webcam. And for individual supervision, we're only allowed to do up to half or 50% of our supervision sessions through webcam but we're really trying to make it so that we're having a lot less in-person contact or maybe no in-person contact um, during this time when um, there are various quarantines and safe for at home uh, rules being issued and so forth. So the 491 board has been very responsive to us throughout um, the initiation of this pandemic. They respond very quickly to us and we have a very nice line of communication with them. They did within a couple of days, have a meeting where they did issue an emergency rule. And this rule allows registered interns to complete their supervision hours through webcam for now as a temporary measure. Um, if I recall correctly, I think it's a 90 day period for now. Um, the second is that they can count telehealth therapy hours towards their 1500 hours of face-to-face -face psychotherapy, but only under a few conditions. The first condition is that the intern, of course, has a qualified supervisor. Well, all interns should have a qualified supervisor. Um, so I, I don't think that one's an issue. The second one is that the intern has to have a telehealth protocol and safety plan in place, which I would hope that the qualified supervisors would be working with their interns on. The third is that, um, and this one has unfortunately drawn some fire and a lot of complaints and concerns. Uh, we've been getting lots of emails and phone calls on this as uh, probably the 491 board has as well. The therapeutic relationship with the client must have started prior to March 19th, which was the day that they issued the emergency rule. What this basically means is if you're a registered mental health counselor intern, then you can only do telehealth sessions with established clients. You can't start new counseling relationships through telehealth right now and allow that to count towards your 1500 hours of face-to-face -face therapy. Um, this is, I think, problematic for many reasons. And one of those reasons is that uh, many community mental health centers rely very heavily on registered interns um, to provide counseling, especially, quite honestly, for low-income populations, Medicaid populations, and so forth. And so, you know, will this mean that um, a lot of people are not going to be able to start counseling relationships during this period of social distancing? So I'm hopeful that maybe there will be a change over time with this, but this is uh, our understanding about the rule for now. The other problem is private practice settings. Many of you know, hopefully the majority of you know that there's a Florida statute that requires that registered interns working in a private practice setting um, have a licensed mental health professional on the premises when providing clinical services to clients. Well, um, that licensed mental health professional doesn't have to be their qualified supervisor necessarily, but we've asked, well, what does this mean in terms of telehealth? 
right now the position seems to be that if you're an intern and you're in a private practice setting and you want to provide telehealth during this period of social distancing, then you do still need to have a licensed professional physically on the premises of where you are when you're providing telehealth to clients, which could mean that there's an office and there are no clients in that office, but you and another licensed mental health professional are in that building, so to speak, and that professional is available should you need them while providing telehealth services. Um, this is obviously problematic, but I want you to also know that as far as we're aware, the 491 board has no power to change that because that is a matter of a Florida state statute and the board does not have the power to change statutes. So uh, what I, I also understand that the 491 board has sought some help I think from the uh, from the uh, state attorney's office, um, could there be an executive order or a legislative act or something along those lines that modifies this requirement during the COVID-19 pandemic and the period of social distancing? And that's what we're waiting on. But as of right now, that is the position that we're in as far as interns go. So I'm going to also take a look here. I know that, um, well, I'm going to hold off on looking at the chat box until we get through the slides, actually. Next, we'll move on to a governor's order, executive order number 2072. This was brought to our attention by members who are asking, does this executive order prohibit us therapists from being able to meet in person with clients during the COVID-19 response period? Because what it says is that any medically unnecessary, non-urgent or non-emergency procedure or surgery, which if delayed, does not place a patient's immediate health, safety, or well-being at risk, or will, if delayed, not contribute to the worsening of a serious or life-threatening medical condition. Um, it, it's saying if that uh, we're not permitted to provide those services for right now. And it covers all healthcare professionals. Well, I think that there are a lot of things to consider here. And one is, if you don't think that the service you're providing is medically necessary or that um, if your client doesn't get therapy during this period of social distancing that that won't pose any risk to their health or safety or well-being then i suppose this might apply but i don't know about you but most of the work i do i would think um, is medically necessary now that was my interpretation but we also sought um, guidance from the 491 board on this and essentially you can read it for yourself, but the way I read their response is that ultimately it's up to us as licensed mental health professionals to determine whether it is safe for our clients to uh, see us in person or not. And that at this point, there's no broad prohibition that would prohibit us from meeting with a client in person per se. Now again, when you get the PDF, after completing the survey for today, you can click on any link and you can read the source of that information for yourself. We've also had the question as, you know, Hillsborough County, for example, has a safer at home rule that's been imposed. So has Pinellas County, various municipalities have as well. The question keeps getting raised on, are we essential workers? Well, there are a few resources to help us piece that together. One is that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has provided guidance on what's considered an essential worker. And when you read, they don't specifically mention counselors, but they do mention caregivers um, such as psychologists, mid-level practitioners, and social workers. Um, by, and these are just examples they give. So pretty clearly, we would fit into, into this category of essential workers. Now, to hit that point even closer to home, Pinellas County Resolution 2020, their safer home order, provides an exception for, quote, healthcare providers and public health operations, including but not limited to mental health professionals, therapists, substance abuse providers, um, clearly were covered under the Pinellas County Resolution as essential workers. And Hillsborough County, they use the same directives offered by the Department of Homeland Security, which we shared in the previous slide. So I think it's uh, very clear that we are essential workers. I've not seen any information suggesting otherwise to date. Now, for those of you who are also SAPs, substance abuse professionals who conduct um, evaluations for the US Department of Transportation for drug policy violations, it's important to know that as of right now, there's been no flexibility on the federal regulations that require those evaluations to be conducted in person rather than through 
webcam or other telehealth means. So those still must be in-person evaluations. That doesn't mean that you have to provide these types of evaluations right now. It just means that if you are, they still need to be in person. So given that half of you or close to half of you are providing some in-office services still, it would be important for us to cover some office precaution options. Uh, and we are getting this information from the World Health Organization, the CDC, and from some other guidelines and resources that folks have put out for therapists, especially those in private practice and small agency environments. Well, the first thing would be to transition as many clients as possible to telehealth to reduce in-person contact. Uh, that is the approach I'm using. I am still meeting with clients in person, but I'm trying to get as many uh, into telehealth as I possibly can so that right now the number of clients who ever come into my office is very small on a daily basis. You can also make, take measures to allow only one client in the building at a time. You can make hand sanitizer um, and, and or hand washing station available to clients when they enter and when they leave. You can keep all of the chairs in your office environment greater than six feet apart and you yourself can never come closer uh, to a client than six feet. Here's the rationale for this. And when we look at how, according to the CDC, how COVID-19 is transmitted, it's really respiratory transmission. Um, so think of a client coughing or sneezing, and then think of what happens to the droplets when there's a spray after a cough or a sneeze. Those droplets will typically settle on a surface within a six foot radius of a client or of a therapist for that matter. That means that those droplets are hitting surfaces like tables, chairs, um, it also means that somebody could touch any of those surfaces that have droplets, and then the droplets could transfer to the hand of the person touching those surfaces. That person then could touch another surface, like twist a doorknob open, for example, or turn a faucet. So you can assume that anything that other people touch in the office is potentially contaminated, um, and that any surfaces within a six foot radius of a client could be contaminated. So for that reason, it would be wise to keep people six feet apart so that if a client is very close to a therapist, for example, and they cough or they sneeze and they were to be carrying the virus, then those droplets would not be taken into the system of the therapist because they're so close to the client. And that's why we were uh, doing that six foot distance. So in my office, for example, all of my chairs are greater than six feet apart and there are fewer chairs in the lobby than there used to be. Um, there are also no magazines because a client could be reading a magazine in a lobby, cough or sneeze, and then uh, onto that magazine surface, put it down, and then the next client could pick it up and touch that same surface. We sanitize all of those common surfaces, chairs, tables, doorknobs, every hour. So it really, in between clients, um, everything's being sanitized. Don't shake hands with a client because that would involve coming within six feet of them and don't touch surfaces that they have touched. Uh, and also I would recommend replacing all of your office paperwork with online forms. Now last night when we did this presentation, we were asked about, do you know of any relatively inexpensive online form systems that are HIPAA compliant? Well, uh, last night what I told you is very different than what I'm telling you today. Last night I said JotForm, J-O-T-F-O-R-M, is what I'm using because they have a HIPAA compliant unlimited um, form online system that's very easy to build forms and disseminate them uh, that was $35 a month. Good news is as of 10 o'clock last night, JotForm is now offering their HIPAA plan for free to therapists as a community service um, in response to COVID-19. Um, and I'll show you how you can get information on that free uh, service that they're offering. I wish I would have known that before I bought a whole year um, subscription to the service, but you guys know it now. So um, JotForm, HIPAA compliant forms, they'll sign a business associate agreement, and then you can um, set, collect forms online. And then that means they're not passing you paperwork that could be potentially contaminated. Have office staff work remotely if possible. So right now in our office, none of our support staff are ever coming to the office. They're all working remotely. This cuts down on any interactions person to person in the office. Also to build up the line of clients to check out maybe in between appointments sometimes. Um, it cuts down on all of that. We use online scheduling and payment systems. 
we as therapists wash our hands every hour, even though we're not touching clients and we're not touching surfaces that clients have touched, just as an extra precaution. If your hand ever touches a communal surface, just sort of consider it to be potentially contaminated and clean it as quickly as possible. Also, I recommend checking your body temperature daily. I check mine twice a day and am logging it into my health app uh, because you're trying to become aware of if your temperature ever reaches a point where it uh, would suggest the potential of exposure. I understand, of course, that people carry COVID-19 without having any symptoms for a period of time, but also many times they will start experiencing symptoms very rapidly, so it's just another of many precautions that can be taken. And of course, outside of your office environment, practice social distancing because that reduces the probability that you will be um, bringing that virus into the office setting if you're not getting exposed outside of work. Post signage on your office door indicating that, client, indicating that clients should not enter the building if they've experienced fever, cough, or shortness of breath. Instead, they should call their physician and then call your office to discuss telehealth options. And I would recommend being more flexible with late cancellation fees right now, as long as it's COVID-19 related. Um, it makes sense for us to be reasonable with our clients and to encourage them to cancel even last minute if needed, if there's any potential um, exposure. Now, as far as transitioning to telehealth go goes, it's important to select an appropriate platform. We already talked about Doxy. There is a Zoom HIPAA compliant version called Zoom for Healthcare. Now, if you were to go to their website, you'll see it costs a minimum of $200 a month as advertised with 10 licenses, clearly designed for clinics and hospitals and larger organizations. If you contact them directly, and you tell them that you are an individual practitioner or maybe a small practice that has fewer, five or fewer licensees, then you can get them to give it to you for $100 a month. Um, so far, everyone that we have talked to has been able to do that if you contact them directly. We have never heard of anybody getting it for less than $100 a month, including myself. And believe me, I worked on it for a couple of weeks. Uh, so if for $100 a month, they will generally give you five user licenses. So if you had other people in your office, you could split the cost, five people, $20 each per month. That makes it actually cheaper in that scenario than the Doxy Pro version at $35 a month. Um, I prefer Zoom for healthcare. I just like the way it interfaces. Um, but I, if I was completely by myself, Doxy would fit my purposes as well. And I also like having more than one platform as a backup. So I have both Doxy and Zoom. Uh, GoToMeeting does have a HIPAA compliant version, but I am not familiar with the costs. There's also G Suite, um, which is a Google product. Again, I'm not familiar with the cost. Now, some of you have practice management systems like Simple Practice. They already have telehealth as a feature. And uh, therapy sites, if you have a therapy site subscription, they also have a telehealth service from what I understand. So these are examples, and when you get the PDF, you can click on any of these links to get more information. You'll want to provide clients with instructions on how to access telehealth, create a telehealth consent form, and I would certainly recommend that you read the brand spanking new 2020 Code of Ethics, section B6, which uh, is about uh, technology-supported counseling, and then section E of AMCA's new standards for the practice of clinical mental health counseling, which tells you all the things you really need to be educated and knowledgeable about if you're providing telehealth. Also complete an appropriate telehealth training program, and I will show you some examples in just a little bit here. And as far as insurance goes, here's a frequently asked question. How do we bill insurance for telehealth? First thing is you have to change the location code from code 11, which denotes an in-office setting, to code 02, which is a telehealth uh, setting. The second thing is that you'd use the same CPT codes you always use, like 90837, 90791, 90847, but you would add a modifier at the end, which would either be GT or 95. Now, GT and 95 modifiers mean that you're using a combination of audio and visual. You can see the client through the technology. You can hear the client through the technology. Why they have two different codes, I don't know. And um, why different insurers prefer one of those two different codes, I don't know. I can tell you that most insurers, from what I've collected so far, prefer the GT modifier. The way this actually looks on a CMS 1500, or formerly known as HICFA form, for example, is that the code would read 
for example, 90837-GT, many of your practice management systems already have these features built into them. Now, unfortunately, not all clients have access to telehealth and their insurance plans. FAMCA has been, we created an open letter to all Florida health insurers trying to get them to um, provide telehealth for psychotherapy for all of their customers during the COVID-19 pandemic response period. But as of right now, it really varies on an individual client by client basis. There are a few exceptions. And I will show you some of those exceptions when we go over the resources in a moment. For example, Optum under United put out an announcement that temporarily they will be allowing all um, behavioral telehealth appointments to be uh, built. But, you know, uh, I'll, I'll show you the thread and how you can access all those resources later because it'd be too much to go into right now. Now, some of you are experiencing increased cancellations. You're having a hard time maybe paying the bills and um, another option is to consider joining various platforms that clients use who are only interested in telehealth appointments. And these are examples, Talkspace, OpenPath, Teladoc, MD Live. Um, now, it could take time to get in on some of these. So you, um, again, if we're thinking there might be months, perhaps a year or longer of social distancing, then it maybe makes sense to get on some of these platforms now if you already anticipate not having enough clients to keep your practice floating. Remember that not all clients will be appropriate for telehealth. Some don't have internet access. I have been surprised to find out how many of my clients do not since all of this started. Some struggle to use technology because of cognitive impairments or other reasons. Some do not trust telehealth or feel comfortable with it. Some do not have appropriate equipment or they do lack privacy in their home environment. Some are not tech savvy and some do not have telehealth insurance benefits. That's part of why I'm still meeting with some clients in person, but taking very strict uh, office precautions to reduce the potential for transmission of the virus. Now, how you can get more information and stay updated on these topics is through our member forums. There's a member forum for the Suncoast Mental Health Counselors Association, for the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association, and the American Mental Health Counselors Association. If you are a member of any of those three organizations, I would suggest that you go to the forum and you join it. If you do that, you will, I mean, you're probably like me, your email is inundated with um, COVID-19 related emails right now. But the good thing about all these forums is that if you subscribe, you never get more than one email a day. It's a digest. It'll tell you, here are all the things that were posted about today. And then you can click on any that you're interested in reading about. And that may cut down on the email clutter a bit. By, but still help you to stay updated. I am going to show you right now how to access one of these resources, and then we'll go into our Q&A session here. Um, let me just make sure I don't have, there we go. Can't have any confidential client stuff on my computer before I screen share, that would be bad. And give me just a moment here. There we go. You should be able to see my browser now. And I'm going to go to suncoastmhca.org. Now, you might say, Aaron, you're wasting my time because I'm not a member. So how can I access the forum? Um, you're right. You can only access it if you join. But it's like $30 a year. So I would encourage you to join, become a member, and then access. Along with all the other wonderful benefits that come with being part of SOMCA. If you go in, you'll see I'm already subscribed to the forum. I'm going to unsubscribe. So you can see, if you're not subscribed, you'll see this, subscribe to forum. That tells you you are not yet subscribed. Just simply click on that link and voila, you are subscribed. Um, and then what will happen is you will get that email digest every 24 hours. There are various communication threads that um, relate to telehealth. Here's COVID-19 resources for LMHCs. And if you click on that, you will see all the stuff that we have been posting and sharing but another important one is COVID-19 telehealth and insurers. This is one where we've been posting communications from various insurance companies that tell you what their current position is on covering telehealth. And we always try to attach a file so you can read the source directly for yourself rather than just seeing how one of us interprets what we've read. So that would be an important thing to consider. 
All right. So now what I'm going to do is stop sharing. And this would be a great time for those of you who want to interact to unmute yourselves so that you can speak directly and freely and ask questions. While you are unmuting yourselves and, and getting ready to ask your questions, I'm also going to go to the chat box. Um, so there was a point, apparently, when you guys lost audio with me and couldn't hear something I was saying. Problem is, I don't know what I was saying when that happened. Um, but if anybody knows what topic we lost audio for a moment on, then please let me know. And I'll see if I can. It was about registered interns. It was the I think the last point that you that you said about private practice. Is that right? Okay. Um, the issue with private practice and interns is because there's a Florida statute that requires a licensed mental health professional be on the premises whenever a registered intern is providing clinical services. How that statute gets interpreted right now in terms of telehealth is confusing. Um, the current interpretation seems to be that. If an intern's doing telehealth, they need to have a licensed health professional physically in the building that they're in while they're providing that telehealth service so that if something happens while they're on that telehealth appointment, they can quickly and easily access a professional, a licensed professional for some kind of insight um, or assistance. I know that sounds weird, but the 491 board has no power to change statutes and that is a statute issue. So we are currently waiting on maybe something like an executive order or clarification from the state attorney's office um, that would help us to do something about that, like maybe amend it so that the licensed mental so that the licensed mental professional has to be easily accessible instead of physically in on the premises. Does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Let's see what else we have. Are they allowing graduate students? to count telehealth hours towards practicum and internship? I would not be able to answer that question. I assume it would depend on the university program and on KCREP, and I, I do not know the answer. If somebody else knows, like a, a, a professor who teaches practicum or internship, then please chime in. I am actually in my practicum right now at USF, and I was told that if we already had the relationship with the client before, we can use those telehealth hours, but we cannot be establishing new clients and counting those as our face-to-face -face hours. All right, thank you for that, Rhea. And uh, by the way, go Bulls. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, we have we have the question about uh, JOT form. So again, it's JOT form, J-O-T-F-O-R-M. And also you will see if you go access Somka's forum, You'll see that late last night I posted the actual email from JotForm about how to access that free HIPAA compliant form system. I've been using it for a week now. I love it. It's really easy to build forms, in my opinion. Okay, someone wants us to type the link for JotForm. So I'm just going to type, it's probably just jotform.com. Hopefully it is. Uh, as for modifiers, I spent three hours on the phone with Humana and no one can answer me. Great. Here's what I've been doing. Um, for Humana, I submitted um, a claim with location code 02 for telehealth and with 90837-GT, the GT modifier, based on knowing that most insurers seem to be wanting the GT modifier. And I haven't got it back yet, but we'll see. Um, that's what I did. And if I get kicked back to me, then I'll just try the 95 modifier and see what happens then. Let's see here. Do you know where we can find a template or some samples of telehealth informed consent forms? So um, there are lots of them. Really, if you just Google telehealth consent form, you will find all kinds of stuff. I found one from a NADAC uh, resource, in the Association for Alcohol and Drug Abuse Counselors. Now it's the Association for Addiction Professionals. Um, just make sure it's an authoritative source. And on the OMCA open forum, people have shared various templates. Uh, you're free to steal mine, which I in turn have Frankenstein together from other authoritative resources. And um, I think OMCA is doing a free telehealth webinar where they're gonna cover that topic. FOMCA is probably gonna be doing a free one with Dr. Susan Mayerly very shortly. 
So look out for that announcement because I'm sure she will be sharing some consent forms. And in the interim, any of you who have good, good informed consent forms for telehealth, feel free to share them on the SOMCA open forum under that COVID-19 resources for counselors mm -hmm. thread so that we can benefit from what each other has. I, I'm not worried about people stealing my forms. I'm fine with you stealing my forms and uh, that doesn't bother me at all. So feel free. Let's see here what we have. Uh, on the SOMCA forum, is there an index or table of contents to look at previous topics of interest? It just kind of shows you all the different threads. I don't know, that is sort of a table of con contents basically. But the two threads I'd be paying the most attention to right now are the ones labeled COVID-19 resources for counselors. And there's another one that says something like COVID-19 telehealth and insurance. Um, they should be pretty clear when you see the two subject lines that those are ones to pay attention to. But again, you'll get the digest every 24 hours if you subscribe. Uh, somebody has said that Barbara Griswold has comprised a list of the insurers that cover telehealth and the codes. Well, that is wonderful. If somebody would like to share that on the forum, um, that would be a big help to everybody, I'm sure. Uh, somebody's duly licensed in Oregon, and they just announced that they are relaxing reciprocity for out-of-state licensees to work with Oregon clients. Is Florida doing the same? So the Florida scenario right now is we do already have a telehealth law, and that telehealth law already allows people who are licensed in other states to be credentialed to do telehealth here in Florida, even if they don't have a license here in Florida. To access more information about this, visit the 491 Board's website, which is Florida's mental health professions.gov. I will type it into the chat here and hope that I spelled it right. Um, if you go to that website and then you click on resources, you should see a link that says something like click here for telehealth information or something like that. And that tells you all about what people in other states have to do to get on the registry to do telehealth in Florida. It's a pretty simple and free process for them actually. Let's see what else we have here. Has anyone heard that we are not supposed to be collecting copays? Okay, so uh, what I've, you'll see this also in our telehealth and insurers thread on the SOMCA forum. Um, Aetna, for example, has said they're not collecting copays, but they s basically inferred that it was when people are accessing services through the Teladoc service, which is a specific app of healthcare professionals providing services. It did not look to me like it applied to people who are doing their own independent telehealth with clients and our contracted providers. It looked like it was only about Teladoc. So if anyone has other information, feel free to share it, but you can read that communication from Aetna on that communication thread. Uh, will you be talking about suggestions for our OCD clients? Oh, great question. So I'm gonna actually show you something about this. We're gonna go back to screen sharing here for a moment. Um, if you go to back to the topics for the SOMCA forum and you look at COVID-19 resources for LMHCs, the very first post that we ever made has a section at the end about OCD. The COVID-19 pandemic raises particular challenging questions for those of us who are treating clients with OCD and anxiety disorders. I have two resources I'd like to suggest for those of us, which probably is most or all of us working with such presenting problems. The International OCD Foundation very quickly erected a website um, that addresses this very issue. They've got lots of resources for clients and practitioners that deal with, well, what if I have OCD and I've been doing like exposure therapy, for example, and also I find myself in a pandemic. Um, what's reasonable, what's not reasonable, what are um, reasonable precautions? At what point does it go from it being a reasonable precaution to a manifestation of OCD? And my short version for this is, generally my opinion is that if you're following the best precautions from the most authoritative sources like the CDC and the World Health Organization, things that are far beyond that, maybe that could be something more um, unreasonable or OCD-like. Things within those parameters are probably reasonable given the current context. It's my general rule of thumb. There's also an interesting article from a client who wrote 
about having OCD and anxiety disorders and also trying to deal with coronavirus fears in a reasonable way, it would be interesting to read. Some of you might have some additional resources, um, but these are a couple. Uh, the International OCD Foundation, I think, is the, the bigger one of the two. Let's see here. We have a question. I took your Zoom webinar last night, and I'm taking it again today. Is another CE available for, ooh, that is a great question. Um, I don't know the answer to that yet. I'm going to have to ask, uh, talk to our office staff, because if they only got approval, if it's the same CE broker tracking number, I don't think you can take it over again the next day and get double credit for it. So if we have a separate CE tracker number and we use the rationale that we're covering different information today, it might be possible, but I think it's doubtful that you'll get dual credit for attending today and yesterday. Um, but we'll look into that for you. Did we get a CE for attending today? Yes, you do. Um, I'm also going to post the link for that CE um, uh, evaluation form in the chat box in just a moment. While I'm doing that, do any of the people who are um, might, do any of you have questions that we have not yet addressed that you'd like to throw out there? I do. Um, Aaron, it's Michelle. Um, hey, Michelle. So I had heard from uh, some medical providers that uh, they had been given official permission, these are Medi Medicare providers, uh, to, they were billing the same rates uh, for telemedicine as they are for in-room care, um, you know, and that being obviously a special uh, condition option at this time to prevent providers from being infected. Um, obviously, it would be more relevant for physicians, um, but I wondered if that was if that was relevant to us as well. Obviously, we're not Medicare covered, so it's a different criteria, but um, do you know anything about that? Um, I do and don't. I don't know about the Medicare issue because quite honestly, I've not been paying attention because counselors can't bill Medicare. Um, okay. So that could be true what you're saying. However, um, I can tell you that there are many cases on the record of counselors being held criminally liable and civilly liable for falsely billing insurance claims as being in person when they were really over the phone or done through telehealth. That's actually insurance fraud. Um, right. It can end up with an invest, a criminal investigation and lots of other things like um, disciplinary action against your license. So right. unless you see something and have something in writing from the insurer, I would suggest that you continue to bill O2 for the telehealth location and add the CPT modifier that the insurer wants you to use so that you cannot be accused of um, insure, some kind of insurance fraud. And do you have to have a separate um, contract to provide telehealth with your insurance company? So Great you question. That's a good one. For example, Cigna, when, the, when we started social distancing, Cigna said, you know what, um, we'll cover telehealth for people that have it on their plan, but you have to sign an addendum to your contract. Mm -hmm. After doing that for about a week, they said, oh my gosh, no longer do we require the addendum because this is ridiculous because they were getting so many addendums signatures and I think they just gave up. Um, so it depends on the insurer. And that's the confusing issue here is, you know, every insurer has their own processes, their own contracts, their own agreements, their own policies. So you really have to look at it on a case by case basis. And every time one of you gets an official communication or you see something on a website of an insurer, take a snapshot or convert it to a PDF or something, post it on the forum so that other people can benefit from what you found out about what that particular insurance company wants. Thank you. I wish I could give you a better answer, but um, my agency says we cannot get in-person signatures. They say we must do telehealth without signatures as they have not set up doc, sign, et cetera, only Zoom. Is this okay for me to follow what they say? I don't think it is. I think you need to have, the clients have to sign informed consents and they have to sign, uh, I think that's still the same as it always has been. I've seen no, no rule, law, executive order, et cetera, that removes that requirement. 
And the fact is, again, it's very easy. Uh, it, they could put together a job form, for example, using one of those free HIPAA compliant accounts and do it that way. There's so many options to set this up in minutes that I don't know why, why somebody would use that practice. Maybe someone else knows something I don't. If I can interrupt. Sure. They had said that there was an order from the board, I believe, saying that it was not required anymore. I called the board and they said that that was the case, but they did not point me or give me the email. They said that they would. So the, the hmm. board had said that that was the case when I called maybe two days ago. Oh, okay. I have not heard or seen I'd anything like to about something that. In writing, though. Yeah, I would too. Um, so if anybody has that in writing or gets it in writing, please put it into the chat, uh, or I'm sorry, into the SOMCA forum. Also, next week, we haven't, I don't even know if the official announcement has gone out yet, but next week, the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association, on Thursday afternoon, we're doing a one-hour webinar. It'll be me, it'll be Dr. Denny, who serves on the 491 board, and it will be Janet, I forgot her last name, I'm sorry, um, who is the executive director of the 491 board. That would be a great opportunity to get clarification on that um, at next week's webinar. So that might be a good one to attend. And by the way, for those of you who are attending today, that's a whole separate event with some, some different content with a different CE broker tracking number. So I'm sure you can get credit for attending that event. What time is the, I'm sorry. What, okay. what time is the webinar? Is that next Wednesday, uh, Thursday? It's going to be next Thursday, and I believe it is, let me see here, 1.30 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, we mm -hmm. just hammered this out last night and this morning, and oh, I look at my inbox, and yeah, it's Thursday, April 2nd, 1.30 to 3 p.m. I don't know if they've sent out an official announcement yet, but if they have it, it's coming. It might not even be on the website, but I would imagine it will be today. So someone asked me to repeat the question. The question was, uh, apparently an agency said, we're not requiring clients to sign informed consents um, for telehealth right now because we don't have the setup for it. I said, I'm not aware of any rule or law or executive order that's been passed that would, pro that would say we no longer need to have signed inf informed consents. And then the response to that was that, I'm sorry, who was it that said that they'd contacted the board? With me. Okay. And that is, um, is it Sam? Mm-hmm. Okay, Sam, great. So Sam said, hey, I contacted the board, and uh, they said, yeah, there is such a thing, but they haven't sent her proof yet. All and right. we're hoping to get right. some proof All right. All right. So let's see what else we have here. Can clients sign off for HIPAA? if the online form will not be HIPAA as in Roll20. I don't know what Roll20 is, but um, what I would suggest, again, is using a HIPAA compliant platform and getting an electronic signature. It just makes good sense to me to be on so, the safe side. So can I speak up on that one? Sure. So Roll20 is online Dungeons and Dragons. Oh. So I do. This, must, that. this is Matt. Yeah. Oh, so, gosh. hi, guys. Yeah, I got a message from Gloria, I believe, from Beacon. And, um, I, I okay, somebody, it would be good for them to mute themselves. Somebody who's having a phone conversation in the background. Sounds like. But anyway, go ahead, Matt. <laughs> so it's just not as engaging, and it's a lot harder to do. Um, I could have them all use, like, I could protect everybody in a different way because to sign on, you like would sign on with your Twitch account anyway, or your or your Dungeons and Dragons Beyond account. So all, all those can be online handles. They don't actually have to be a person's name. I know who they are because I know them, but that would be my other way of doing it. Yeah, I mean, I would think in that scenario, there's no HIPAA regulated information that's going back and forth because there's not an identifier like a client's full name or date of birth or a social security number or something. So I would think, you know, I'm no attorney, so I'll give you that disclaimer, but I would think that would be okay. 
And also, Matt, it would be great wow. if it, if somebody could give us evidence of that um, alleged order or rule that says that we don't need to get the signatures anymore anyway. Um, that would probably be very helpful. So hopefully somebody will submit that soon. Yeah. I, I mean, I know with DocsMe you can just transfer files on the professional level. It's really nice. I've actually got my consents that way already. Oh, great. Okay, wonderful. All right, well, thank you for chiming in on that. And by the way, I love the stuff that you do with uh, Dungeons and Dragons and group work, and oh, it's wonderful. Thanks. It's a lot of fun. All right. So, uh, who else has some questions for us that we haven't gotten to yet? So I'll I will email her and forward it to the client. Hey, I figured out who it was. I needed to mute. Yay! All right. So. Um, I think uh, I think we've answered all the questions in the chat box right now. That's cool. I had I had one. Um, I'm looking through my emails because I was trying to find the, the one that you guys are referring to. Um, I did find one that says it's 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 through Beacon, so it's one of the insurance companies, and it says. HIPAA compliance, it says, providers are encouraged to use appropriate HIPAA compliant telehealth platforms to communicate with individuals. Um, when leveraging widely available, available communication apps such as FaceTime, Skype, um, to all extent feasible, ensure the same rights to confidentiality. Providers must inform members of any relevant privacy considerations. Site restrictions on or where services are performed. So I think it differs from providers, what they're allowing and not allowing as far as that part goes. As yeah, as I think you're absolutely right about that. And then there's, you know, there's like what's legally required, what's considered good clinical and ethical practice by our profession, and then there's what the insurers require. Yeah. And those, it's nice when they all align. And uh, um, usually the, the, the government um, rule is minimal. Um, it's here's the minimum that you can get by with. And then in our profession, we usually go above and beyond that with what we want to be in a consent form. If you go read the, um, I mean, there, I've seen so many, I know that there are many authoritative organizations offering free um, informed consent telehealth forms out there right now. Mm -hmm. And it really, a simple Google search, I was able to pull a bunch of them up very quickly and easily. Um, so also somebody saying simple practice software addresses health risks, et cetera, and their privacy policy forms and the client signed this document. And then, um, as has already been raised, the various insurers will say, you know, here's what we want you to have in such a consent form. So it is quite a, quite a cumbersome process to figure it out. And I imagine many of us will, will start with an informed consent and then maybe we'll end up tweaking it. Um, based on new information that we get from various insurers or other resources. But if you have a good one, please post it in the forum and share it. That would be a wonderful resource to, for us to get out to everybody. Again, the question's been asked, how do we get copies of the slides? Uh, so fill out that SurveyMonkey um, form that I sent a, a link for. Hey, by the way, don't try to get your SurveyMonkey account to become HIPAA compliant. It will cost you $10,000 a year. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So I tried that one out. It did not go very far as soon as they gave me the pricing for it. I'm like, are you crazy? So job form is the route I went instead, obviously. Um, let's see. I don't think, I think we've gotten all of our questions, and it's about 1 o'clock. So hopefully you got what you were looking for today, and more is going to be rolling out. You may see that we start doing various just impromptu, just counseling collaboration meetings throughout this whole pandemic where we're all collaborating and getting an opportunity to stay updated. But certainly join the forums, become a member of SOMCA if you're not already, and, um, and we'll keep you updated and keep sharing your resources with each other. My hope is that as long as we kind of stick together on this and we're supporting each other, 
then we will be better anchored and uh, then we'll be able to pass that sense of um, stability onto our clients during a very difficult time as well. So thank you all so much for coming today and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Last okay. question I'm putting on the chat. <laughs> yeah, and don't forget to do the survey one more time. I'm putting it in the chat box. Click on the link, fill it out so you can get your CE approval and your slides from today. Oh, and do you need to be a FOMCA member to attend the webinar next week? No. Um, it was, I think, no. I, I guess, I know it's free, and I think it's going to be open to all mental health professionals, regardless of whether they're a FOMCA member or not, just like this one was from SOMCA. So hopefully I'm right on that. Yay, thank you. All right. You're welcome. Have a good one. Stay safe, everybody. Be safe.